Welcome back everyone for today's video we are going to be taking a look at my second game from my first match here in the FIDE World Cup in Baku Azerbaijan now as you guys know it's a two game match I started playing with the white pieces yesterday I pressed very hard against my opponent but the game ended in a draw today is the second game and I'm playing with the black pieces now obviously it's very straightforward if I win the game I move on to the next round if it's a draw we go to tie breaks and if I lose I am eliminated from the competition so here we go once again I'm playing cards Karthik Venkataraman from India, and he opens with this move d4. I play knight to f6, play c4, I play e6, knight to f3, and now I play the first surprise of the game, which is this move b6. Now, this is the Queen's Indian defense, it's an opening that used to be very popular at the top level in the 1970s, the 1980s, and even into the 1990s, but in recent times, it's fallen out of favor. I have not really played this opening all that frequently outside of the 2016 candidates tournament, which was held in Moscow, Russia. Now in that term, I played the Queens Indian. It's an event. It's an opening that I prepared for many months before the event with the famous trainer, Peter Lecco, also a top level player as well. I think he's doing commentary here in fact. So I had prepared the Queens Indian defense for that event. However, it did not work out very well for me. I lost Levon Aronian, I lost to Sergei Karyakin, and then I scrapped the opening entirely and I started playing the Queen's Gambit Declined instead. And I actually did well with it. I won a critical game against Veselin Topolov towards the end of the event. Nonetheless, I decided to play the Queen's Indian today to try and surprise my opponent. Plays g3. Bishop b7, bishop g2, and now I play this move, bishop b4. Now, the main line these days is generally bishop to a6, but it's very, very sharp, and there are many different ways that white can respond to it. It is worth pointing out that bishop a6 is what I did play in the candidates back in 2016. So I go bishop b7, we get bishop g2, and now I play bishop to b4 check, and he plays the move bishop d2. We trade the bishops, he takes the queen, and now I castle out of the center. He castles back, and I play this move pawn to d6. Now, it's very simple so far. All these moves are pretty straightforward for both sides. What I'm trying to do here is develop my knight to d7 and then play either c5 or d5. Additionally, if white can say play knight c3 and get this e4 move in here, white can potentially be quite a bit better here with this big white center. If I ever play e5 and white goes d5, now the bishop on b7 is very passive behind this pawn wall. So I don't really want to allow that to happen. So after I play d6, we get queen to c2, and now I play this move c5 after quite a bit of a thing. Now, it's worth pointing out that in this position, the move that is played most of the time here is this move bishop to e4, but after queen to c1 or queen d2 for that matter, I have to retreat the bishop back to b7, because if I play knight d7 here after knight c3, bishop b7, white can now play this move d5 or even queen c2 followed by e4. Either way, white is getting a big white center once again, and it's very difficult to play. So I have this big decision here during the game, which is do I want to play Bishop E4 and potentially make a threefold repetition in the first 10 moves of the game and go straight to tie break. Now I spent quite a bit of time here thinking about what to do. And at the end of the day, I felt that I should try and play on not only simply because it's a match format and you don't want to give your opponent too much respect, but also because you simply want to try to find out more about your opponent's style, how they play in certain positions. All these little things play a role. And for that reason, I chose not to play Bishop E4. Instead, I played the move C4. Five. After c5, Karthik plays move rook d1, which is very, very solid. Now, in a lot of d4, c4 openings, generally speaking, there are a couple things that are important. If white ever imbalances with d takes c5, or even if you get something like, like a Benoni structure like this, for example, it can be very double-edged with chances for both sides. And I'll actually show you what I mean by that. Let me go back to the start of the game. So one opening that you can play very frequently with black pieces is the Benko Gambit. Now, if white plays d5, you can play the Benko Gambit, or you can go into the Benoni as well with this imbalanced pawn structure. However, if white wants to be rock solid and not push d5 and play knight f3 for example after takes takes generally it's very hard to create a big imbalance and win the game with the black pieces so for that reason because it's so difficult to create winning chances in the in these structures normally this isn't what happens now it's also worth mentioning that what was the other structure I wanted to point out? The other structure was, uh, yes, Magnus's game yesterday. So Magnus played something kind of similar. I think it was something like this, if I remember correctly. Just, just I could obviously pull up the game, but I don't want to do that. Where we they reached some position, I want to say it was something like this maybe. Maybe I had the position a little bit wrong. It was along these lines where 
it felt like uh, Pansulaya, the, the Georgian Grandmaster, he ended up imbalancing where they got the structure with pawns on d6 and c5 versus c4, but he never had to allow that. He could have played something very solid, for example, with a queen c2 and some kind of rook d1 and always aiming to not trade the pawns and just capture back on d4 with the knight. Now, again, I don't have the exact position, so I, it could be slightly different, but I think the point still stands about the pawn structure. So when I go C5 and Karthik plays Rook D1, and he does not imbalance the structure. Now it becomes very difficult to play for me because if I don't trade the pawns on D4 here and I play Queen E7, after Knight C3, maybe I can go Knight C6 here, but White now can play D5 here. And this is actually a very bad Benoni structure here after Knight E5, something like takes, then E4 followed by F4, and White has a big advantage. Now, to be clear, I could have tried to do something like this, but if I do this and I'm wrong, I can get into a lot of trouble very, very quickly. And additionally, after the first game yesterday, it's very clear to me that my opponent, when he gets initiative, when the moves, when he's feeling the rhythm of the moves, he can play at a very, very high level. So for that reason, I did not want to go into this. And that's why I regrettably traded the pawns or had to trade the pawns on D4. And after takes, he took back with the rook and I play this move queen to E7. We get knight C3 and now I play knight to C6. I would love to play knight BD7 here and play as like a standard hedgehog with all these pawns on the fourth rank, but I'm not quite in time to go knight BD7 here, or at least I didn't think I was because white can double stack with rook to D1, putting a lot of pressure on this pawn on D6. And now if I play D5 here, I think after takes, takes, there's some kind of tactic where takes, and if I take with the bishop, white has e4 to overload the bishop. I can't go to c6 because white takes the bishop, and if I play rook c8, white can line up the legendary triple stack with the queen and the two rooks, and after bishop c6, white can sack the rook for the knight and the bishop, and at this point, with the bishop and the knight for the rook, white should be technically winning. So I really want to play knight pd7, but I'm not in time, and so I have to play knight c6 instead, which makes it a little bit more difficult to play d5 and get rid of this weak pawn on d6. So I go knight c6, he plays rook d1, now I play rook c8, he goes rook c1, and I play rook d8. I would have loved to have played something like d5 here, but after takes, knight takes d5, after takes, takes, and queen d2. Now I have an isolated pawn that's very, very weak here, just to illustrate the point. After knight a5, let's say white goes b3 to cut off knight c4, h6, knight d4, and white has a big advantage. There's an isolated pawn, the bishop is spying, and the knight on d4 is blockading the pawn, and this is just a great position for white to play. So, I play rook fd8, he goes b3, and now I have to play d5, getting rid of, rid of the weakness. Or I should say, I don't have to play. The computer actually says that I can play a6. And after a move like queen b2, I can go for this very unusual idea with knight a7 to play for b5 or d5. And the computer thinks it's still equal, but in a situation like this where if I mess it up and I get a worse position, it's going to be very difficult to defend. And if I actually lose the game, I'm simply eliminated. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That being said, we do learn things from computers every day. So obviously, I will keep these ideas with a6 and knight a7 in mind for the future. So here I play d5, trying to get rid of the weakness. After pawn takes pawn, I go knight to b4, forking the pawn and the queen. And now after queen b2, knight takes d5, I've eliminated the weakness, the pawn on d6. At the same time, however, we now have a very symmetrical pawn structure. We both have pawns on the, the e file, the f file, g, and the h file. We also have b, pawns on b3, b6, a2, a7. So due to the pawn structure here, the position is very, very drawish, and it's very hard to create any complications. So my opponent plays knight to e5, We trade the bishop. I trade the bishop, he trades the rooks, and then he tr takes the bishop on g2. And now I have to be a little bit careful here to not go wrong. Now I played this move knight d7, simplifying and trading the knights off the board. It's not the move that I wanted to play. I initially wanted to play queen c5, but after queen d2, threatening the classic ice skater checkmate on the back rank. One example, queen e5, queen d8, knight e8 takes. Uh-oh, spaghetti -o. Game over, match over, I'm eliminated from the event. So, I have to be a little bit careful. Now, the computer, of course, because computers are 3,500, unlike us pathetic humans who are only close to 2,800, uh, it says that you can still play on with h6 here, but after queen d8, king h7, knight f7, just seeing this from afar, it feels really, really scary. And if I'm wrong here, I am just going to lose the game. Computer says after knight to e4 here, e3, queen to c2. After queen h8, king g6, knight e5, king f5, knight g4. This looks very, very scary. For example, if I take the knight, it's mate in four. After queen takes g7, if I go king f5, g4, gg, game over, match over. Why not, as we say? And if you play knight g5 here, white can simply go h3. If you go to h5, there's g4 check, king h4, queen h6, mate. And if you go to f5, which is the other way, after g4, king to e4, there's queen d4, checkmate as well. And the king gets stuck in the center of the board. 
So it looks really, really scary. Now, as I said, the computer actually says that here you can play knight g5, and apparently it's still a draw because after h3 you have queen e4 check. But in a situation like this where it's very flat, very drawish, to go for something like this where if I make one wrong move, I'm going to lose and there are no complications is simply not worth the risk. And of course, I'm not a 3,500 stockfish, so I can't play perfectly. So unfortunately i play knight or i have to play knight d7 now it's worth noting as well that this is very similar to a lot of catalan positions where if you're not careful it looks like it's very drawish but if white can get let's just say f3 and e4 in, for example you get a position like this with queen d2 white is actually a little bit better here because the knight doesn't have this d5 score the pawns prevent the knight from jumping to the center the queen's on the open file and if white can get something like b4 and then b5 and to plant the knight on c6 very very quickly it can potentially be winning for white so you have to be a little bit careful that's why you Use a little bit of time and then I did play knight d7. It's not the move that I wanted to play, but the knight on e5 is better placed. My knight doesn't really have the safety on d5 because white can kick it right away. Or actually, after knight d5, I think white's supposed to play queen d4 and then e4. If I go queen c3, there's queen a4 here threatening the ice skater once again. Um, so I, my knight's not really stable on d5 because of ideas like e4, and that's why I played knight e7 to simply get rid of this knight on this great central square. And after, after the knights come off, now it's very, very simplified, and the game should end very soon in a draw. So we trade the knights. Now I play g6 here. Karthik plays h4. I play h5, trying to stop the lolly checkmate on g7. One sample line is if white can get the pawn here, suddenly there's this lolly mate with queen g7, and it can get very scary to play. So I don't really want to allow that, so I play h5, and once again, we have a symmetrical pawn chain for white from f2 to h4 and black from f7 to h5, and there isn't really a whole lot. Nonetheless, Karthik tries to run with the king. He plays king f3, and now I play this queen b7 move. Now, I do have to be a little bit careful here, because if I play a move like queen c2, for example, maybe white can start to run with the king. I guess this is actually, maybe the specific line wins, because I think there's a queen a5 move. But it looks kind of scary here because if white can get this king to h6 suddenly they're mates with queen g7 maybe queen b8 as well and you do have to be a little bit careful however actually queen c2 would, would have been a mistake because white can now play queen b8 and after king g7 white can take the pawn guard the pawn on a2 and on first glance it looks like this should be a repetition or there should be a way to keep checking the king forever but after king to h2 here suddenly it gets very tricky to play because now if you take on e2 after queen b6 queen a2 suddenly white has an outside pass pawn that you can run up the board and this is very very similar to an end game that i played in the year 1997 in the world U chess festival i played a game against the egyptian player amin Bassam, and it was quite similar i think the pawns were the same on the king side but he had an outside pass pawn that he pushed down the board to beat me i I think that was in like the fifth or sixth round of the world U chess festival under 10 in Cannes, france in 1997. so there's no reason to go into this because with this pass pawn up the board this pawn in the center i can't really push it quickly up the board and so i don't want to allow that so what i play here just to be a little bit careful is i play queen b7 checking the king and after king to f4 i play this move queen to e7 here stopping the king from getting in and more importantly guarding this pawn on e6 so if white plays a move like a4 i can always play f6 here kicking the queen back and then i kick the king back and now my pawns are pawns are connected this of course is a classic bathtub formation as well so nothing can go wrong when you have the bathtub so in this position my opponent karthik decides sort of to give up here in terms of trying to create any chance of winning he plays the move king to f3 and now he plays move queen to a3 trying to win the pawns on a2 and b3 and now he forces a draw with the repetition he checks on b8 checks on e5 and the game ends in a draw here after queen e5 king g8 he would have kept checking of course because he doesn't want to lose the pawn on a2 and if you go queen a1 here it's still probably fine but after b5 the queen is very passive guarding these pawns and if anybody has chances here it would be black and in a match situation there's zero reason to go for this so game ends in a draw so i've drawn both games in the classical portion i had my chances yesterday i was pressing my opponent defended very well so i couldn't win today was probably just a very boring game from both of us there just weren't many chances for either side which means that tomorrow i will be playing in the tiebreakers now it's going to be a similar format it's going to be two games of rapid 25 minutes plus 10 second increment if it's tied after that i believe we go to i think more rapid with 15 minutes plus 10 and then we go to blitz if i'm not mistaken with five plus three so there could be a lot of games tomorrow but all the mini matches will be two games one game with white one game with black so the matches have to be tied after two if they're not tied after two games one of us will move on to the next round so not great perhaps i tried with white couldn't win opponent defended well today no chance it is what it is we move to the tiebreakers tomorrow and it's going to be pretty exciting obviously i'm looking forward to it and i will obviously be back with another recap after i play my match tomorrow 
in the rapid portion or the tiebreak portion against Karthik Venka Venkata Raman. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this recap. Make sure to hit that subscribe button below if you haven't already. And I will be back with another recap tomorrow after I play the tiebreaks here in the FIDE World Cup in Baku, Azerbaijan. See you guys. Bye.